It's rare to hear from people who've escaped from North Korea. Today's guest, Charles Rue, escaped not just once, but twice. This is an animated short of the full interview, also on our channel. Enjoy. When I was 14, I got my first opportunity to escape North Korea and go to China to my father because my father wanted to see me. And then I went to Reaper. You went to the river. Yeah, oh, to pretend like you're just going for it. Yeah, time. going down the river. You know, I was like, um, I'm just gonna go to swim over here. You know, and then I crossed the river, and then like, okay, so some guy with a hat and a blue shirt and the jeans and like, what kind of shoes? That's your father. Go find him. I saw my dad, and I got into a taxi cab, and we drove straight to the hotel. Right, I was living my life in freedom for a moment, but unfortunately, police came to our house with a gun, and then they handcuffed me. And then they took me to the jail. Finally, we're getting, we're getting deported to North Korea. And then the, the truck rolled us stop at the border and the guards were screaming at me to get off the truck. And then, yeah, I got to the first interrogation part. And then I was standing right in front of the cell and this one lady, she bites off her vein and she bleed to death. She bit her yeah, wrist bit open? Her, yeah, she bit her wrist open, wide open because she got caught in Mongolia. And then like 20 days, I was in there. So uh, right after 20 days, I got transported to a um, re-educational detention center. They are brainwashing us for nine months. I worked really hard and months passed and I was not released. I'm going to get the hell out of here and I'm going to escape again. They tell us every day, you escape again. We don't care, but don't get caught. If you get caught, you're dead. And then nine months later, I was finally released from the labor camp because I have lost so much weight that I was worthless worker. Two police officers shows up and then they took me away. And after spending like months trying to regain my strength, I needed to find a job. I started working in a coal mine where I was paid only in rice. And most of the boys that were working in the mine were my age. We would push a thousand pound steel core cart miles into the mine. If you got out of the coal mine and then sometimes my rain boots, it's leaking. So I can't tell it's a blood or it's a cold water because it's so sticky. It could be blood, you know, because like sometimes you'll land it on people, you'll crush people, you know, there's like people losing arms, legs because of the coal mine accidents. So sooner or later, I'm going to be like that. I knew how hard it is, like, it is to escape North Korea without any money or food. And I knew that if I was caught, I could be killed this time because mm. like this is second time escaping, you know, so there is no mercy. But those kind of risks overweighted at working in the dark coal mine every day until it was my turn to lose a limb or die, right? So which one is worth it? So one morning, uh, instead of entering the mine, I walked up the path and began running. And then on a humid day in August, I was lying down on a hillside. And in the distance, I saw a train come to stop in the middle of nowhere. And I looked at the sign. It says, from Pyongyang to Hesan. Hesan is like the border town, right? This is my chance. I need to get on that train. So I, I walked into like the crowds and I, I tried to like blend in and I was pretending I was belong there. And the guard stopped me and asked Man. me like, oh, can I see your documents? Can I see your birth certificate? And I lied that, oh, my mother had them and that she was already on the train. For the next two days, I was hiding on the train. I was almost the border town when the hand of guard grabbed the back of my neck and dragged me to a holding cell on the train. And as the guard locked the door to the cell, he, to he told us that we will be handed over to the authorities. So as the train began to slow down for the next stop, I jumped off the moving train, rolled into a ditch, and began sprinting for some nearby trees. I walked for like hours, illegally catched a second train, and two days later, I finally made it to the border town. I'm already determined. The next day, right, I walked into the river that divides North Korea and China, which is Yellow River. And then I hid in the tall grass. It was finally dark. And I thought it was my time. And then I slowly walked into the water. Halfway into the river, I slipped on a rock and I let out a scream. And then immediately, a floodlight was on my back and I heard a soldier screaming at me. Oh man. Stop, stop, or I will shoot. And I decided not to stop and I kept waiting ahead. The guard was kept screaming at me, but he never pulled the trigger. And then I went into the cornfield. I'm in China now. And I walked in China for three days. I didn't know where I was going. My feet got blisters and it started bleeding. 
and I can't walk anymore. I'm hungry. I'm exhausted. And I started regretting. And then I really thought about, should I go back? I just slide on, on the road. I thought, do whatever you want. I'm religious. I'm Christian. And then I, I pray to God. And I pray like, I didn't want it to die like this, you know. And I cried and cried until I became more dehydrated. I couldn't cry anymore. 10 to 20 minutes later, a Chinese dude riding a motorcycle stops and he turns back and he comes to me. Are you from North Korea? I was like, wait, well, Baba is a He's like, get on the motorcycle. motorcycle. Yeah. yeah. And then we got to his place. He connected me to a South Korean missionary. So do you think it's a coincidence or it's a miracle? <laughs> so I embarked on another long journey to Southeast Asia. I know how dangerous that journey is because I've seen a lady biting off her vein, killing herself because she got caught nearby Mongolia. And then about a week, I got to Southeast Asia. I got to Thailand. And then we voluntarily surrendered to um, Thailand police. I'm not going to lie. That was the best day of my life, going to Thai prison. And then I was trying to apply for South Korea, but they didn't recognize me as refugee because my father is Chinese. Chinese government doesn't recognize me as refugee and they sent me back to North Korea. But you guys don't want to help me? And they're like, we would have to send you back to China. One one guy who like recommended me like, hey, you should apply for UN. You should um, apply for America. So I applied for UN. Most of people, they have to wait a year to get a first interview, right? But for me, I got my interview within a week. And then I got my second interview in the second week, third week, fourth week. I went to hospital. I got my body checked out. Everything's good. And then you're going to go to America. The day that I got my plane ticket, I could not sleep. Even better. Way better. I remember, I remember looking out the window as the plane began to land in California. As I stepped off the plane, I felt these strange feelings that I've known before. You know, it's safety. I was finally safe and didn't need to hide anymore. For the full two hour long story, check out Charles Rue's interview on The Jordan Harbinger Show in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening to podcasts. You can also click here for a video version of that interview and click here to subscribe to the show.